Welcome to Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast, where we meet experts from all walks of life to learn their intrinsic motivation so that they can share it with the world. What do we have in store today? Stay tuned to find out more. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in podcast land. Hello, everyone. This is Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. I am Hamza. I am David. And today we have the wonderful Vincent Jenna. He is a world-renowned psychic and medium. He has been on a um, show that David and I have been listening to a long time, Coast to Coast. He's been on the Hallmark Channel, a, a CBC, a CBS, NBC, everywhere that you've been looking for the most important psychic and medium in the world. And we have him on our podcast today. Welcome to the podcast, Vincent. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's really uh, thrilling to be here and a privilege. Yeah, I'm happy that we got you today. I, I know we were trying to get you before for Halloween. I know you were doing a big promotion uh, about Halloween, but it, we're happy right. to get you during the holiday season anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in all honesty, there's more ghosts during the holiday and the Christmas season than there is even during the Halloween season. I was going to ask you that because I was thinking, you know, people begrudgingly go home and they're there with Aunt Alice who brought fruitcake one more year in a row and (laughs) we weren't happy to see her. Hey, wait a uh, minute. I love (laughs) fruitcake. Probably the only one in the world. When we meet a person, I need to shake your hand because, yes, I do not know. Oh, I knew you were going to laugh at me. Oh, that was too funny. <laughs> I know. Well, she, we were reluctantly wanting to run into Aunt Gladys during the holidays, but she has transitioned many years ago, and you said that they're around more so during the Christmas season, so that means that we need to set a plate for her. Are you saying that? I, I am, actually. I am. But for a very different reason than most people really think. And it's for the, it's the, the highest vibrational time of the year, the highest energy, the highest consciousness, the most love, shall we say, and the most positive time of the year, believe it or not, is during the holiday time at the end of the year between Christmas, between Hanukkah, between all of the celebrations. They're all celebrations for the same reason. What a great time to leave the physical plane to go to the spiritual plane. And that's mm. why most people do it during the Christmas season. Mm. I know. Now, to us, saying goodbye would seem really bad and negative and, oh, my gosh, you've ruined Christmas on me. My, my, my lover has died, is gone. I've had friends just recently that did pass, and it is sad. But if you think about it, If I'm going to choose a time which is going to be helpful for you to be able to deal with it and cope, here I am choosing a time, and we do choose, believe it or not, statistically and scientifically, um, we do unconsciously choose when we're going to die, even how we're going to die most of the time. I was a hospice social worker for several years, and I've seen this over and over and over again, like people waiting until loved ones come to visit them before they transition or um, waiting until people leave them alone so that they don't have to transition in front of, of loved ones. So there is a choice here. And what a time period because, yes, you'll grieve, but eventually the joy of the season will come back. And you'll remember me during the joy of the season, and the grief won't be so hard to ruin that love, that holiday season, that giving, especially if you have other loved ones in your life. Mm-hmm. Oh. Okay, okay, that's a, either a grunt of, I don't like that, or I don't believe that. <laughs> Tell me, explain the grunt. <laughs> oh, no, that, there was no grunt. That was like, uh, I agree with you. <laughs> oh, okay, good. All right, good. I like that. I like yeah. that. It's... Yeah. Um, 
one thing that I was thinking of is uh, during this time of year, you know, there's a lot of uh, television shows and movies like Frosty the Snowman or my favorite Charlie Brown Christmas. And the, one of the biggest stories is, uh, what is it, The Christmas Story? A uh, Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol, thank you. And you were, you're visited by, you know, you in the past and you get to see yourself in the future if you stay the way you are. Do you feel that if, in keeping with the theme of that movie that people make that transition when they look at what they've done in their lives up until that point, and then they're just like, you know what, I think I'm, I'm good for this car- incarnation. It, it would seem like that's possible, but in actuality, people don't start assessing until they're actually in the transitioning process. So up until then, um, they could be fearful, um, they could be in pain, they can be uncomfortable. And remember, as a hospice social worker, I'm dealing with clients that their, their transitioning process isn't pleasant, okay? My friend, who is 42 years old and an ex-professional football player, was out just the day before Thanksgiving with his kids at a jump zone and fell to his knees and dropped dead of his heart just stopping right there. And there was no pain, and it was quick, and he was 42, now sad for the family, unbelievably sad for the family. But Thanksgiving was a very important holiday to him because it represented being with the family. Now, all of this that I'm talking about, I'm not talking about conscious choices here, okay? 95 to 98 percent of the human mind is in unconscious awareness. Only two to five percent is conscious. Okay, so that means there's so much going on under the surface that we're unaware of. Not to mention, besides the human mind, there's the soul's mind that's attached to us. And the soul has an agenda, and the soul can help us. And, and if it's in the person's story, contract, best interest, whatever it may be, that it moves on, it's choosing those time periods that still are best in that person's life. The second highest um, day of transitioning are birthdays. So birthdays and Christmas. Now think about birthdays. Here you come into life and you're leaving on the exact same day. Now, coincidental? Absolutely not. Meant to be something special? Absolutely. You see, we still, and that's primarily United States Americans, don't have a culture of discussing death. Okay, Mm -hmm. they hide it. They don't want to talk about it because of the concept of you can't take it with you. Other cultures around the world honor death and they talk about it all the time. And they'll sit there at the dinner table and they'll say, you know, mom and dad, you're in your 60s now. What's the plan? What do you want to do um, when you die and you move on? What you know, they honor it because it is a continuation of life over in England. And, and part of what I honor about mediumship is one of the reasons why it's so revered in England is because it's become a religion there. Spiritualist churches will have mediums in the services give connections and readings to their congregation members that are there during the service because they're constantly wanting to reinforce the continuation of life. It doesn't end, but we look at it so dark and dismal. And, and not to mention, it, it's because of all the stress and the pressure of life, we're actually not leaving the way we should be leaving, okay? It should be when we're done. It should be uh, less painful, less suffering, less grief, okay? But it's not, unfortunately. But that doesn't mean that it's not special and holy and sacred. And so why not pick those holy and sacred days, right? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's hard to come by. Now, the interesting thing is that's one of the other reasons why ghost stories have come about during the winter and Christmas seasons is because people are dying anyway. 
And also adults really like scaring the, the bejesus out of kids, you know? And so <laughs> it, it started that way. And it started out of fun. The history of ghost telling, ghost stories, is really a very fun um, history, which is pretty amazing. It was all about entertaining, believe it or not. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Yes, it, and it started before Charles Dickens, but it did start in England, okay? That's where it really began, and, and stories were told, because during the winter months, and they, they were confined to their homes, it was cold right outside, there was no TV, no radio, so families and friends gathered, and especially during the holiday season, and they sat around, and they played games, and they entertained each other, and one of the games that they played is who can tell the scariest ghost story? Oh. Okay, so there are actually a couple of famous stories I can't remember offhand that were written prior to Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. But then, of course, that's where Charles Dickens went into it. And it was always a scary story in the middle, and some monstrous ghost was going to come out and eat you and eat your food and all of this stuff. But in the end, everybody survived and lived and changed their lives and lived happily ever after. So it always changed, but they certainly wanted wanted to do that spooky scaring and it was so funny and, and it also is based on paganism um, and they used all of that and some religious stories that they used to tell ghost stories but it really is a very fascinating history of, of you know it's even in the song you know uh, in, in one of the songs that that we sing at Christmas time so it's it's unbelievable how history and tradition went down through the generations and is still going on till today. Wow. It made me think of, there's like a, a joke, it made me think of um, every year they show a commercial with Santa Claus and, and M&M's. And they're like, I, I love it. They're real, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they both pass out at the same time. Yes. Yeah, so there should be like where we would interject where there would be an apparition eating the cookie and they're like, they're real. I can't believe <laughs> that's, that's right. But let me tell you something. I mean, um, Jacob Marley, the ghost of Jacob Marley, I can send him to many people that he could wake up. Boy, let me tell you something and talk about the, the chains and how long they're going to be when these people move on, uh, especially today. We need to send some ghosts to people's houses. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you something about that with Jake, the Jacob Marley story because uh, a few years ago I was with a, a mediumship group and it was around the ho uh, Halloween and we had gone to a house and we were just learning, you know, just getting our feet wet with, with the modality. And so uh, we had gone through and, and, and obviously there were things going on in the house. And one thing that I remember was this lady, she was the mother of the house, and she was telling the group, like, get out. Like, we're invading her space, right? And so we were kind of like, oh, okay. And, and we left. And everyone in the group remembered that night that she kind of came to us, like, how do you like how that feels? Like, she was invading our space the day after, you know? So uh, they're somewhat territorial in some cases. They, they very much are, especially if it was their house or land. OK, um, and those and now we need to define the difference between regular entities and spirits and how you and I most likely will transition, how all of us will transition versus ghosts. OK, ghosts are not the average entity. They're the ones. Well, let, let's put it this way. You've always heard the story of. Uh, the tunnel of light that uh, people that have had near-death experiences always describe. I saw a tunnel and light, and I went through it, and on the other side, there was peace. There was people, people I knew, you know, yada, 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 Jesus, everybody, you know, Buddha, um, yeah. you know, wh whoever. And that tunnel of light actually does exist. There are many dimensions to life, and the earth, the physical earth, is in the first, second, and third 
dimension. And there are other earthly dimensions, the fourth, fifth, sixth, and possibly the seventh and the eighth, which is closest to the physical plane, is where other dimensions exist. As a matter of fact, the black hole in space is actually a connection between dimensions. Okay? So now when we normally, we go through whatever death that we go through, we go through that tunnel of light. It's like an express train to bypass the earthly dimensions to get us to the heavenly dimension. Okay. That's what's normally supposed to happen. However, if you're an extremely negative person, if you are so materialistic and, and so determined to hold on to this earth, if you are an evil or, or bad person, a real bad criminal, um, or a fearful person, um, a child who is, is fearful and lost and had, or had a treacherous death of any kind, you can actually miss the train. You can actually see the light and not go through it because of fear, because of shock, because you don't know what's going on. If that occurs, you are now without a body, but still an energy. And that energy can only hover in the earthly dimensions. Those are ghosts. Now, all different ghosts, just like all different people who are alive, could have different attitudes, right? So just think about hanging around this earth plane. Nobody sees you. All your friends and family, they can't see you. They can't talk to you. You can't communicate with them, and you're stuck. So you can get pretty frustrated, pretty angry, and if you were angry and negative to start with, you can get pretty evil acting. Okay, there are no demons and there are no devils, okay? They're only us and the worst side of us. And so you've got these people stuck here, and so they can hold on. They can take hold of a home. They can take hold of an area, and then they can come and they can kind of spook you. That's the idea of poltergeist. However, they actually cannot hurt you any more than your belief gives them power to. Yes. Okay? So they can't possess you. They can't enter you. Not unless you give, just like on earth, when you're living, nobody can manipulate you unless you let them. Right? Yes. You, right? Right. So it's the same thing with ghosts. So that's the difference between ghosts and entities. Well, let me ask you something real quick, Vincent. Would you say um, it would be the same thing in regards to, like, voodoo, that you can't really be affected by it unless you, like, you're, you know, in fear of what, you know, what they're saying they're going to do and this and that? Yes. Let, yeah. me, let me give you a metaphor, okay? okay. And it's, it's based on this question that has been asked of many, many people. So it's interesting to see what your answer will be. If a tree falls in the forest and there's no human around to hear it, does it make a noise? Make a noise, yeah, I've heard that. What do you think? Mm. I would no. say no, because our awareness isn't there. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit better than that. You're right. It is no, because it makes a vibration. Yeah. It requires a human ear and brain to translate the vibration into a sound. As a matter of fact, all other creatures experience that vibration completely different than we do. So that's the same thing. In order for voodoo, in order for witchcraft, in order for possession to work, you need a human there who's going to believe it. Otherwise, it's nonsense. Yeah. Okay? But we are so capable, I'm not going to say everybody is, of being manipulated. I mean, look. Look in life and look at even just the United States today. And look at how manipulated people are in the way that they're thinking. Yeah. Okay, the fear, the negativity and all of that nonsense that's going on in our country today because they're being influenced. Okay, those are the type of people, just like the Nazis, 
who were influenced by the leaders, all the German soldiers who were influenced by the leaders and all the people to hate the Jews. That is a manipulation of weak minds, so it's very easy to curse somebody. I mean, even an intelligent person, if I turn around and I say to them, you know what, you're going to have a terrible day today, I know it. And they think of that at all, or they don't turn around and say, oh, no, I'm not. I'm in control of my own life. I'll be fine. I'm going to have a great day. Yeah. They will actually manifest bad things happening to them. So that's how voodoo works and witchcraft and witchcraft. You need to have a sucker on the other end to believe it. Yeah. Let me ask you, Vincent, the, the other day, David and I, we were talking about walk-in. And oh. uh, in the, you know, we, we were saying more so the phenomena was more in the 80s. Uh, we, we didn't hear any stories or, or I'm not aware of any walk-in stories that happen currently. And like you were saying, you have to be aware. But with the walk-in, that usually happens if someone's in an accident or they've had some type of trauma where a spirit may come into their body. Uh, what's your take on that? Yes, there was a, I, I'm very familiar with Edgar Casey's material on walk-ins, and you're right. It came about during the 80s. Um, that's actually when I had my spiritual awakening. It became popular during the 80s when metaphysics and the New Age was more acceptable, okay, that people started admitting it. So it was always there. The concepts were always there, but they weren't talked about. Today, those aren't as necessary because now between the New Age movement, there is the New Thought movement. And the New Thought movement attempted to take the woo-woo, okay, the crazy stuff out of metaphysics. However, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. It just doesn't mean that we're focusing on it as much anymore. Nowadays, we're listening to trance spirits, right? Abraham Hicks, very famous um, trance spirit. Before him, it was Edgar Casey, and that was quieter, more gentle. Now everything is about Abraham. He's got all these books outside, and everybody wants to see Abraham trance. So who cares about the walk-ins at this point? But they are arrangements. They, you can have such... A terrible life your soul is is like had contracts with all of these people and it's just wanting out well the, the the two things that are going on yes you can make an arrangement and that can happen while you're unconscious you're in a coma whatever the case may be and you're completely unaware of it and somebody comes along however what's happening now more than walk-ins are escape clauses okay and that's the reason why you see so many people dying today the past couple of years actually had the highest number of deaths in the history of the world and that was in the ratio a comparable ratio with the population so it wasn't as if well the population is what caused the spike no the ratio is correct. The number of deaths spiked. And the number and the age range spiked. The reason being is now this is what's happening. In the past, past lives, we would come down on earth and we'd live here, what? And before they, uh, m medical science became so uh, technological and capable, People were dying at 49, 50 years old, 55, whatever. Now they're living until their 80s and their 90s, right? Well, who wants to go anymore 80, 90 years having created horrible karma for yourself that you have to fix later on, okay? So instead, you build in out clauses. So you'll say something like this. By 25 years old, if I'm not on the path that I need to be on, I'm going to come down. I'm going to either get sick. I'm going to, something's going to happen, and I want out real quick. I'm going to leave. Okay? My friend did that. He was 33 years old. He was about ready to make the biggest mistake of his life because he was on a spiritual path, and he started with me. I was the one who taught him. 
the wife that he had, sweet and wonderful and on the path with him, but wasn't as into it as he was. Well, he met a co-worker who is very spiritually versed. The two of them had an affair. He was about ready to tell his wife and two children, I'm leaving you. Okay? The day before he was about to tell them, he was rushed to a hospital with acute leukemia and died in six weeks. Wow. He never told them. He never had the chance to make that big mistake. I've spoken with him. He's come to me many, 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 many times, and he had an out clause. And what you see today, people are tired. They don't like what's going on in the world. And unfortunately, you'll get some gurus and spiritual teachers who will tell you things are getting better. They're not. They're not getting better. They can get better. We always have the option. But right now, they're not. As a matter of fact, we're taking some step backwards rather than forwards. I mean, think about it. We're still fighting things like equality today. That's ridiculous. We should be way beyond that at this point in the history. We're 11,000 years old, and we're still worried about where a guy is going to pee. Okay? That's the most ridiculous thing. So we're stepping backwards, and we're blaming all of these people for all the things that are going wrong when it's ourselves, and we're not healing ourselves. So people are leaving. They're left and right all over the place, and they're leaving from aneurysms. My daughter-in-law was at a work conference with colleagues. The colleagues were only 27 to 35 years old. They went out to dinner Friday night. Saturday morning, they had a meeting. They all arrived except one guy. 27 years old, he was left in his room to be dead. He had brain swelling. Nothing was wrong with him, brain swelling. He's gone. He left for whatever reason. We don't need to walk around being fearful that that's going to happen, but we certainly can open up our eyes and start taking more positive steps in our lives to stop that from happening. Mm. Wow. Well, Vincent, you mentioned uh, that in the 80s is when you had your spiritual awakening. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What was that like? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was like a tidal wave. It was definitely a Steven Spielberg and Cecil B. DeMille epic movie that happened to me. <laughs> I, I had a com completely tormented life as a, as a kid until I was 17 years old. The kids in school used to pick on me, beat me up, shove me in lockers, flush my head in the toilet, throw me in dumpsters, strip me and throw me in assemblies, spit on me, pee on me. Then I got home and because mom had been sexually molested by a relative who lived with her, um, she had mental pathology, so I used to get beaten by my father to, through her orders, humiliated and emotionally abused from her. And then a relative who babysat me all the time sexually molested me until I was 13 years old. And then the parish priest who came by to help mom out, he molested me as well until I was 13 years old. So I had a really bad childhood. In that, there was one guy in my school who was the jock, and he instigated much of my abuse. At my 10-year high school reunion, I went to it. I had just finished doing the movie Grease. I was a professional actor before I was a, a, a psychic medium. And I did movies and I did television. I was a singer and dancer in the movie Grease, the original one with John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John. So we know how famous that became. And it yeah. became famous really quick. And so I felt really confident going to my reunion. And the guy who was my greatest antagonizer, he embraced me and befriended me. And from that point on, became one of my dearest friends. His yeah. life was falling apart at the same time. Nobody knew it. He wouldn't tell anybody. Something inside of me was telling me BS every time he said, oh, my career's going great. Oh, my, my, I've got the love of my life, my wife from childhood. I got three kids. They were all wonderful. And I kept hearing BS, BS, BS every time he spoke. But I didn't know how to help him. So one day after spending a weekend with him in Connecticut, my wife and I, I'm on my way home driving and I'm crying. I am crying because my heart is breaking. I'm feeling his heart and it's breaking. And I'm crying out to God, please, you've got to give me a way to be able to help him. 
In hindsight, I thought it was very weird of me to not pray for him and for God to help him. I was asking God to help me help him. Now, I don't know why I did that. Now I do. I didn't then. And within a week of asking that, that's when everything happened. And I'm talking being introduced to psychics that I'd never had even cared about before, nor I ever wanted to visit or go to. And now the psychic is telling me that I'm going to be a spiritual teacher and that all of this stuff started happening and apparitions started to appear. I started getting downloads of information into my head like it was going to explode. Thank God my wife had been with me since I was 17 years old, and she knew I didn't know anything about the metaphysics or spirituality or anything. I only knew about Catholicism, right, and Judaism because she was Jewish. But meanwhile, I started speaking and spewing out knowledge. I was trancing like Abraham. I was trancing my higher self and and speaking all of these words of wisdom and knowledge and, and, and what people were saying. And then I became psychic. Then I started seeing dead people. And so this happened to me over a course of a few months. And, and that's how it wind up coming to me, but I still, it took me a while before I ever wanted to use it. I didn't want to be a psychic. They were crazy people. <laughs> You know, what was I supposed to do? Put a palm outside my, you know, my, my house and say, brother Vinny, you know, I was cousin Vinny. I wasn't brother Vinny, you know, (laughs) ridiculous. So I hit it and I never said anything to anybody, but then I, I felt urged and I started studying because I wanted to know what was going on with me. So I studied all the education material. I was taking classes. I went to seminars. I just did as much research as I could and started understanding what was happening and that I was, I was awakening who we all really are. And, but I was awakening a new mission, a new purpose that I didn't realize I had. And so eventually I started doing it part-time and doing readings part-time. It wasn't supplying enough of an income. I had two kids, and I didn't know how to make it a full-time job until the universe, God, and life changed that for me Mm -hmm. and gave me the opportunity, gave me the opportunity to return to school. I figured, let me go for a degree in psychology and get my MSW in clinical social work. That way I have more credibility than just being a psychic. And I did that. And then a car accident actually took me out of that job back in 2008 and left me jobless with double vision. I had brainstem injury. I couldn't drive. I couldn't be a social worker anymore. And what fell into my lap is people were calling me for readings and people were asking me to speak in different places around the country. And it literally turned into a full-time job all by itself. And I accepted it. And, I, and, and now I understand my entire past and that that was the contract and the path and blueprint I created to get here. It's pretty amazing for everybody if you allow it to happen and you believe in it and you take that road. I'm nobody special, but I definitely hooked on to things that I know are important and our ability. And with that, I help people believe in themselves now. I know what it's like not to believe in yourself and to feel tormented and to feel worthless and useless. So that's my primary goal is to change that and transform people's lives that way so that they can believe in themselves. That's how it happened. That's a wonderful story. (laughs) In a nutshell. (laughs) In a nutshell. (laughs) <laughs> and an interesting, if I'll throw you interesting, it's Christmas time, right? And yeah. so I was in England. Um, one of the things that I do as a psychic and a medium is the same thing I did when I was a psychotherapist. I had to take continuing education credits in order to keep advancing my skills as a psychotherapist. Well, I wanted to do the same thing as a psychic medium. So I went to one of the most famous and best colleges. It's a college in the UK, in, in England, actually where there are t- tutors from all over the world um, in, and, and country teaching and tutoring you in advanced psychic and mediumship skills because they revere it so much. So I studied there, and while we were there, 
during one exercise, and I was supposed to also in my life write a book. Um, and so one day during an exercise, a meditation, we had to allow, instead of just speaking with the spirit, to feel the spirit and let the spirit enter us as much as we can. And so I did, and I saw this gentleman with white hair, white beard, white mustache, white coat. Everything was white, even his hat. And he, and he, he kind of like sat in me, even though I saw him, he like sat in me. And I'm like, oh, wow, okay, who is this? And he said, well, I'm your favorite author. And I was like, favorite author? I, I, I never really read a lot. I listened to a lot of books on tape when I did all of my research, right? And I don't remember authors, none of them. And there were so many books that I read. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't know what he's talking about. And I said, well, my favorite author, which one? And he said, well, I wrote your most favorite story. And I'm like, now I'm immediately thinking my most favorite story is A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. I actually did a musical here in Raleigh that's A Christmas Carol. And so I'm like, are you kidding me? No, wait a minute. He said, I also wrote, and he starts listing these books. I had no idea that Charles Dickens wrote those books. Thank goodness there was an English teacher in our group of students. And after the meditation, I went up and I said, who wrote A Tale of Two Cities? Who wrote? And I went on and on. And she said, Charles Dickens, Charles Dickens. I said, are you kidding me? So literally, I was able to, he said, I can call upon him at any time when I have trouble writing my book and he wants to help me. Well, sure enough, I wrote my book and every time I had brain freeze and block, I would call upon Charles. I know it sounds crazy, but I'd say, hey, Charles, you said you would help me. Come along. I need a word. I need a sentence. I need a paragraph. Well, how do I say this here? And my head is like frozen and all of a sudden it just popped in. And so I was able to complete my book that way. So Charles and I have a really good relationship. And I was so excited when they came out with a new movie about him this year, this season. You've got to see The Man Who Invented Christmas. It's incredible. Huh. I'm writing that one down. Yes, there's my story of Charles Dickens. He was an amazing person. And, of course, the story I absolutely love, and it was so moving. And, and it changed history in England and in the world, he impacted with that one ghost story millions of people after he wrote that story all over the world. Right? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Pretty amazing. So that's how it happened to me. You know, kind of like I walked down the street and boom. <laughs> yeah. Let me, I, there's so I much wish, I don't even know where to go direction. Oh, go I know. Let me tell you, I wish I was one of those guys. I'm envious of other psychics and mediums who said, oh, I had it all my life. When I was five years old, I walked into my bedroom and there was an angel sitting on the edge of my bed. I'm like, God, I walked into my bedroom and my mother was sitting on the edge of the bed with a belt because I did something stupid. I don't know. You know, there ain't no angel there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me ask you. Uh, well, who was who was who was Charles Dickens' muse? Wait, ask that again. Who was Charles Dickens' what? Muse, right? If he's your muse, who gave him inspiration? Oh, that's a great question. You know what? I never asked him that. Um, I don't know if he did. If he turned to anybody himself. A lot of times we do, but, but some of these luminaries, well, m most of the luminaries, okay, and including us, why it's so important to honor your inspirations, your visions, your thoughts, your, your flashes of dreams, your imagination, because before you came here, you put everything into place. So in some dimension are your dreams. Plato knew that. The, the philosopher Plato, he said and he theorized, he philosophized, I guess, that the only reason why humans can create something, like say a chair, a table, a house, no matter what, is because the form of it exists somewhere already in the mind of God, they say. Okay, Carl Jung called it the mind of God and the collective unconscious. He called it forms. 
What it really is, is in another dimension, you've put everything there already. Your job then is while you're here in the physical is to manifest what you have in the ethereal cosmos into physical reality. But because of free will, it's all by your choice. So in other words, every single one of us start out with a blueprint. And if you know anything about contractors or building homes, you'll know that the blueprint may be the starting guide, but it never ends up. The home never ends up exactly the way the blueprint is. It's constantly being changed, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But if we stick to the blueprint as much as possible, even if we go off track, even if we have some alterations, life is going to be easier for us. We're going to be able to bring in those and manifest into the physical reality what we've already placed there. So inspiration, so all those luminaries, all those authors already created every single story. Wilbur Wright, Henry Ford, um, Thomas Edison, they all talked about that. Matter of fact, Wilbur Wright woke up one morning and went to his brother. He said, you know what? We have to start working on this machine because I had a vision that people were sitting in something while they were going across the sky like a bird. And, and Orville said, you're crazy. That's your imagination. We can't come up with anything like that. Only birds can fly. And Wilbur said right to him, he said, no. If I imagined it, that means it must be real. Yeah. Henry Ford said the same thing. Thomas Edison said the same thing. They all said the same thing. If I imagined it, it's got to be real already. So inspirations mean they're already there. We only have to believe that they're there in order to bring them into reality. And life would be so much easier. Everybody is struggling because they don't believe anything is there. And that's because of our stories, you know, our youth and everything like that. So, so maybe Charles did and didn't have some guides to get him that inspiration, like I had the book, I just needed some help here or there, but Charles didn't give me the book, the book I already created. He maybe have reminded me. He may have even taken my words to give to me, right? But he came right. to me as him, as an author, an author I would love because I would accept that easier than if I saw my own soul come to me and say, here, this is what you want to say. You know what I mean? I'd rather yeah. take it from Charles. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. There, there are a couple of stories uh, when you said that. That was, that was huge, That what you just said as far as your awareness or uh, being open to receiving a message. And uh, it reminds me of Oversoul 7. Uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Abraham, but I'm also a big fan of, of uh, Seth and all the oh. Jane Roberts stuff. Oh right, my God! Yes, love that stuff. And you know, they have countless stories where if another entity had come in and you weren't accepting of that person, you wouldn't have taken that message. But if it came through as you know Rudolph the Red nosed Reindeer, then you would have accepted it. Yeah. Um, I had a question when you had mentioned early on about the unconscious awareness that many people are are transitioning just because they're they're kind of fed up and. It, it seems. What's your take on a of of a theme of a broken record? Like people are continuing to incarnate because they're not completing what they set out to do when they did incarnate. Oh wow! That what an excellent question. It's it's not just some people. It's all of us, which is one of the reasons why we're not moving forward. All right. There are two words that are very important in our lives. The word is restitution and retribution, okay? We are normal, loving, caring, with all the God qualities beings. That's how we were created. That's who we really are. Also, what the force created from the beginning and put into motion 
which is a forward motion, we now naturally always want to move forward. Carl Rogers was a contemporary psychologist, and he theorized and came up with humanist psychology, which is the concept that all human beings would advance and move forward if you just remove the environmental constraints that were imposed upon them. So those are the beliefs, those are the old stories, those are all the experiences. You remove that, we're going to naturally move forward. We, we always want to advance. We always want to advance. However, what winds up happening is because we're good beings, and then we come on this earth, we start getting caught up with those two words, restitution and retribution. So, in, and, and, and the way we're raised, we're raised being told we're sinners, we're raised being told we're bad, you made bad decisions, you're stupid, you're ignorant, um, you don't listen. There's so much negative criticism that comes upon us, okay? We feel bad and we take on blame, especially in the beginning, we're very egocentric as children, and we think the world revolves around us, so we take on blame. It's the only answer that the mind can come up with is, it must be my fault. Okay. Well, we hold that attitude, and because of our, uh, uh, our punishing system, our punitive system, we're constantly right, being punished, being like the criminal system and the, and the judicial system. It's all about punishment. So... Here's the difference now. Restitution is the concept of knowing that if you made a lower choice, you know and feel bad for it and are able to say, I'm not going to make a choice like that again and move forward. Retribution is the concept of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So here we are, we go through life, we get all of this pre-programming, all of this nonsense, all this negativity, and now we transition, and kind of like there is a review on the other side, there's a million and one wonderful movies about that, and there's even stories about... You know, um, the book of life in Judaism it gets looked at and reviewed when you get up there to the other side. Um, there's Peter at the gate who's going to make judgments as to whether you can enter or not. There's a whole bunch of stories like that, but it's actually true. There's a review that goes on. And whoever is there, maybe your highest guide, maybe, maybe God, maybe somebody else, maybe Jesus. It doesn't make a difference who it is. But it's a higher being that turns around and asks you, well, how do you feel about the life you just led? And the person turns around, one person goes, well, you know what, I, I did, you know, I did think I did really well. Yeah, there were a couple of times I did some stupid things. I felt bad about that. I shouldn't have done that. I know I'm never going to do that again, but I feel really great. Oh, fabulous. Okay, go ahead. You do what you want. Go on. You know, you want to go back there again? Fine. I don't think I'll go back there right now. I'm going to enjoy myself here. Now another person comes along. Well, how did you feel about life? Oh, man, it was terrible. I was terrible. I was terrible. I, I, I got drunk, I got in a car, I killed an entire family. Oh, wow, okay, well, do you, do you know that that was a, a, a lower choice? Oh, yeah, I do now, but I can't go, okay, are you able to let go of that? No, no, I feel so guilty, I feel so terrible. Well, you, you know you need to do something about that. You can't just walk around feeling guilty and terrible. Yeah, I know it, I know it, I know it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back there. I've got to get the souls that are killed. Where are they? Okay. And now you make an arrangement with the souls that are killed that you're going to go back to earth. And in order to make up for it so that you can feel better about yourself, you'll turn around and you say, you know what? Can we go back down to earth again? And you'll be a family again. But I tell you what. I'll be a burglar, I'll come into your house, you have a gun, and when I break into your house, shoot me. And then I'll feel better. Okay, that may sound really stupid. However, think of this. Think of two guys that are horsing around, they're friends. I'm talking living guys. They're horsing around, they're friends. And one of them accidentally elbows his friend in the eye. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. What's one of the things that he turns around and says to his friend? Here, do me a favor. Punch me. Punch me. Go ahead. Punch me in the face. Punch me in the arm. It'll make me feel better. Right? Mm. 
That's yeah. the problem we have with reincarnating. We think in order to release it, in order to feel better f- about ourselves, we will allow ourselves to be hurt, to be punished, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, to make up for it. So we keep creating these circumstances to be hurt, to be abused. The problem with that is the more you allow yourself to be abused, the further away you pull from your higher self and the God force within you and completely forget what your original plan was and who you really are. There's more anger that builds up. So that's why you keep repeating the same pattern over and over we need to end the concept of karma karma is not a law it's a principle we're the one to choose to go through it or not we need to break that pattern and stop it because we're constantly coming back to make up for the lower choices we made and we don't have to do that all we have to do is remember restitution and mercy and forgive ourselves yeah. and let it go. Yeah. I know that was a long story, but it had to in order to explain truly and have people understand, have your listeners understand why we do what we do. Yeah. No, that, that was actually a, a great way to put a pen in, in it. <laughs> I don't even know. Where, plus, we're at the top of the hour, and I wanted to give you some time. I, I saw on your site you had an upcoming event tomorrow. I wish we were in Raleigh to come to that, but what else do you have going on in the, in the coming week? Well, I'm after tomorrow, I'm kind of resting a bit, but then um, I'm traveling again all over the country, um, speaking at the International Association of Near-Death Studies organizations that are throughout the United States. Um, I do a lot of on Uh, actually teleconference, just like what we're doing right now, um, teleconference courses, and I teach people how to open up their psychic and mediumship awarenesses. Now, what's important about the way I teach and what's empowering about it, I use those skills to help people unblock their lives period. So in other words, most of the work that we do isn't just about becoming a psychic. It's about clearing the garbage out of your channels and life and closet so that your whole life is affected. People's lives have been completely transformed by the classes that they, I've been giving. And so that they'll hear, if they go onto my website at vincentjenna.com and they register there, I only send out emails when I'm doing a special event or I'm doing a class or I don't inundate people. They'll be able to find out when my next class is. I'll be holding one in January. It's usually four weeks. It's very inexpensive. I make it very available. And I keep the class limit down to about 10 to 12 people so I can give individualized attention to them. And it is life transforming for anybody, even if you have no experience in the metaphysics at all, Everybody is psychic. Everybody can communicate with uh, anybody on the other side. They just have to open up their awareness and channel, and that's what I help them with. So, so the other way of also of communicating with me is my Facebook page, Vincent Jenna MSW. I do the first of the the first Wednesday of every month. I do Facebook live events where I actually will make connections for anybody who's there, and that's completely free. I want to be able to help as many people as possible. So there's many ways of communicating with me, um, so through my Facebook page, social media, and through my website. And Jenna is G-E-N-N-A, so make sure when you guys check out the site that you spell that last name correctly so you can find out more about that. Um, I'm on your site right now for the class that comes up next month. Is that in your online store or under your services? Um, That's under my services, um, and and it's also under my – It'll be under my events. Uh, it, it may not be completely updated right now. Um, my person gets updates every so often, and I don't know what date she is. Uh, but it'll be up there soon, and people will be able to see everything that I'm doing. Fantastic, fantastic. It was a great hour spending with you, Vincent. Uh, Vincent Jenna, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. I am Hamza. And I am David. 
And thanks again. It was it was wonderful. I hope you have a wonderful and restful holiday season, Vincent. And same to the both of you. And thank you so much for inviting me and asking such exciting questions. I I, I love interviews like this. So thank you for letting me share. Oh, you're thank very you so welcome. Much. Thank you. Okay, bye now. Bye bye. Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.